a change uh, last week on the lab schedule, so I was able to be here. But how many how many of you missed it? All right, so I'll have to figure out what we're going to do. We're probably going to just double up uh -huh. on the lab. Yeah, it, it turned out I could be here, so I, I just came on that day. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we'll continue. I'll post the, the video in the lecture. But anyway, uh, what we have is, if we're dealing with some kind of substance, you know, substance, what is the substance again? That, the definition of substance. Yeah, usually it's pure. It's either a or a compound or a, it's not a mix. Usually we don't call it a mixture. Sometimes you can, but normally when it's a substance, um, and it depends on how it's, how it's defined, um, a lot of people will call everything a substance, you know, whether it's a mixture or not. But strictly speaking, from chapter one, the definition should be a pure compound or pure element. If it's a mixture, then we'll call it a mixture. But it's, it's, is it so strict? It's not so strict. But anyway, if we have a pure substance, you know, some people will just put in pure here so that there's no confusion. And maybe it's a good idea to start putting in pure there because people use the term so loosely. But if we're dealing with a pure substance, then we, we want to know, you know what its properties are. Obviously, we want to know mixture properties as well, you know, when you mix things up like air. But for a pure substance, you know, we're looking at the properties, both physical and, and chemical properties. And some of these you can gain insight into, so like for example, water. You know, if you're looking at water, does it have a, uh, as far as physical properties, does it have a relatively high melting point, a low melting point? You know, what is its melting point? Well, it's a liquid at room temperature, so we would think it has a relatively low melting point. You know, if it's a solid, then you know, its melting point is going to be higher. So it's kind of got a low melting point. Then we think of other properties. Well, if it's a solid, like H2O solid, let's just do with ice here. Um, is it soft? Is it hard? You know, what do you, what do you think about H2O solid? Is it a soft or hard? It's hard, but is it as hard as rock? No, it's not as hard as rock. And a lot of rocks are composed of minerals. There are some rocks that are pure, others that are mixtures. But anyway, H2O is solid. Now, if we compare that to something like sodium chloride solid, you know, there's a pretty big difference. You know, sodium chloride has a very high melting point. It's hard to melt this stuff. If you tried, if you ever tried melting it on the stove top, um, you aren't going to be successful. You aren't going to get a high enough temperature to melt it. And so sodium chloride um, is hard to melt, but water is easy to melt. And so um, one of the things that clues us in to this is the structure. You know, um, sodium chloride forms a lattice type structure, whereas water, the molecules just pack together. And so this, this consists of molecules. This consists of a lattice structure. And so that's going to lead to differences in its physical properties. And so if we're interested in the physical properties of these types of things, we could look it up. I mean, um, if we typically would look it up because somebody else has done it. We can make some estimates, you know, as far as as far as uh, you know, relatively high, relatively low melting points, this type of stuff. And so, you know, uh, one source, which is, and not everything on Wikipedia is reliable or accurate, of course, but a lot of the scientific data has been reviewed. And the scientific, a lot of it is pretty, pretty accurate as far as. And so, um, NACL. You know, we expect it to have a relatively high melting point. We could see just by looking at um, a data table like this. Oh, Wikipedia saves a lot of money. You don't have to buy these expensive books. So there are a lot of expensive books that compile this data, which is up here. It's, it's freely available, which is nice. 
the melting point of, of um, sodium chloride, table salt, 801 degrees C or 1474 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you set your oven to 1474 degrees Fahrenheit? No. There are some, you know, there are scientific ovens that you can set to 1474. In fact, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I was working in the lab, we had an oven. We had an oven that you could go one up to 1600 degrees Celsius. 1600 degrees Celsius, I could melt sodium chloride easily. That oven. But that oven, you know, what it consists of, the heat element in that oven, pure platinum. It's a platinum oven. That, at that time, that oven was very expensive, uh, but you know, platinum, the, the price of platinum skyrocketed. So that, that, that oven's probably, I don't know, half a million dollars now or something. I don't know how much. But it's just a small oven. Uh, anyway, uh, this, this is very high. The density, 2.165. You know, density of ice is actually less than water, you know, ice flows, etc. So this is the physical properties that we can get. Okay, but what about the chemical properties of these types of things? You know, if we're thinking about the chemical properties, what do we look for? You know, for physical properties, we have a list here. We can look it up on Wikipedia. That's a compilation. But is there a compilation of chemical properties here? You look. I want the chemical properties of sodium chloride. No. Go down. No, 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 no. Oh, this is interesting. Water, salt water is a very important mixture. And so here they're talking about uh, mixtures of sodium chloride and water and how it behaves. This is a pretty interesting uh, mixture. This is an important mixture of salt water. But I'm looking for chemical properties. Go ahead and see it. I'm not yet. So maybe in the in this I might have some. Here they talk about um, uses of sodium chloride. Well, here's one. You know, uh, the chloroalkali process. This al the chloroalkali process is used to make this. It's a very important uh, chemical. Which is good sodium hydroxide. It also makes not chloride, chlorine. Chlorine and chloride are totally different. Our book calls this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, it's the same element, chlorine, but totally different behavior. Chlorine is a green gas. Chloride is the anion. It's something like table salt. So, which one is more? Reactive. Which one's more stable? Which one's more reactive would be chlorine or chloride, chemically? Chloride, chloride. chloride is more reactive. Can you eat chloride without dying? Uh huh. It's not necessarily the same because you got to think. Um, let's just because we eat sodium chloride. In, yeah, in that sense, yes, sodium, both. Wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have, that's just, just an experience. You can see, okay, chlorine gas. Let's see how reactive this is. Maybe aluminum and chlorine gas. Okay, let me pause it here. Do you see this yellow green gas? This yellow green gas is chlorine gas here. And so, for one, you know, chloride and chlorine are quite a bit different. You know, chlor chlorine is gas, chloride is some anion that's usually in salts, and salts are mostly solid. Then, if you think the taste is going to be totally different, you know, chloride versus chlorine, you can really taste this stuff. I mean, uh, in fact, I know the flavor of chlorine very well because, you know, when I was growing up, um, the, the water supply was uh, uh, 
sanitize using chlorine, you know, that the kills bacteria, whatever. Um, and so all, well, the water always had a taste of chlorine a little bit. It was a very small amount, like one ppm chlorine. You know, I mean, just enough to kill everything. Yeah. But, so I know it. A, a higher concentrations, it's, it's a lot nastier. But, you know, or you swimming pool. So you go to the swimming pool. This is just warm aluminum metal. Aluminum is like chloride. We have the top reacting with moisture in the air. So now you can see that the reaction is getting very intense. You can see the flame in the bottom. So the aluminum is being consumed as it's reacting. Anyway, that's aluminum burning in chlorine. Because I know that chlorine, aluminum will burn a lot better in chlorine than it will burn in oxygen. How do I know that? How I know that is um, this. How I know that is I, I've seen this chart enough that I know that you know fluorine's at the top, and then here's chlorine. Where's oxygen? Oxygen's down here. So um, chlorines will call more powerful oxidizer than oxygen itself. So you, you don't even need any oxygen to burn that aluminum. That aluminum burn plenty fine in just chlorine. You wouldn't even have to heat up the aluminum to burn it in fluorine. You just put the aluminum in there and you can fire explosion. So they just warmed it up to get it to react faster. But anyway, uh, chlorine is a lot nastier than chloride. And in fact, the, your book is going to call this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, they're actually conjugates of each other. And so chlorine is highly reactive. Chloride is highly unreactive. And um, <clears throat> as far as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde goes, uh, which one was the highly volatile one? Mr. Hyde? Okay. And so chlorine would be Mr. Hyde, and chloride would be Dr. Jekyll. Chloride is no problem. The same thing goes at the other end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the sodium and sodium ion. So we have sodium metal and sodium ions. Which one's Dr. Jekyll? Which one's Mr. Hyde? Sodium ion is Mr. Hyde, or? Which one's the more volatile one, more reactive one? Sodium metal or sodium ion? Sodium ion's the more reactive one? So, like, if, if table salt got put into water, would you expect an explosion to occur? Did, did I show that video on Thursday or did I show it earlier? Did I show the video? No. I didn't show the video? All right. Rolling barrels into the icy lake Le Lenore? No? Yeah. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. That's barrels of what? Barrels of sodium metal. So they roll barrels of sodium metal into the frozen lake and um, resulting in huge explosions, right? That's because sodium metal is like. Mr. Hyde, you know, very volatile, very reactive. How do I know? Because the most reactive is lithium. And then sodium ion, if you roll barrels of sodium chloride in the lake, are you going to get explosions like that? No. So it's totally, totally different. And so even though they're the same element, because of the charge, their behavior is completely different. And this is why chemist in chemistry, we care so much about charge. We care about Coulomb's law. We care about electro, what we call electrostatic attractions and this type of stuff. Um, because electrical forces are the most important for us because they make a huge difference in reactivity. A sodium with a zero charge versus sodium with positive charge is hugely different. Same thing with this, a manganese, a manganese with a um, plus four charge 
like in manganese dioxide or manganese four oxide, is hugely different than manganese with a plus seven charge. Manganese with a plus seven charge and permanganate is highly reactive, very dangerous. Manganese four oxide is what you call desert varnish, which is uh, a patina on top of sandstone rocks off by Las Vegas. It's very stable, it's very unreactive. And so depending on the charge, it makes things highly reactive or not. And so we're always concerned about the charge um, this is why oxidation states are so important in chemistry because we want to know the charge. We need to know how the things behave. Uh huh. Um, in terms of uh, being more uh, reactive, um, which ones are more reactive? Uh, cations or ions? Or, um, or anions? anions? Yeah. It depends. It depends. Yeah, you got to take it case by case. You, you just can't put it in a blanket because if you say cations are more reactive, let's say. Did I tell you the, the story about the silver ions? I had a um, I had a student who were using silver nitrate one day, and um, silver nitrate is a pretty decent oxidizer. You know, if you look at uh, silver ions, they're here. I, I it's, you know. It's, Silver ions are pretty decent because, you know, above it's nitrate, bromine, and you know, all these are pretty decent oxidizers. Not super powerful, but, you know, pretty decent, pretty good, you know, better than some of these others here. They're shown. Iodine's a decent oxidizer, too. I mean, iodine, they use in, in like, betadine solution, that kind of thing for oxidizing stuff. And so, uh, anyway. Um, so it's a good oxidizer, plenty enough to oxidize your skin. And so what happened was you spill some on your skin, your eyes, whatever else, it's going to oxidize it. When it oxidizes, it takes electrons from whatever. You can take electrons that are causing damage, oxidative damage. A lot of people love antioxidants, right? Well, you, the silver ions are plenty good oxidizer. They're going to oxidize the heck out of your skin. When they do that, it forms silver metal. This silver metal. Um, occurs as tiny, tiny crystals which deposit into the cells and you can't wash them off. You know, they're pretty much incorporated in there. And so um, all of her hands were completely stained black from silver. The tiny crystals of silver look black. They don't look silver. And um, anyway, she had an important job interview that, um, that she ended up washing her hands for I don't know, was it 30 minutes or so, nonstop. But any, so that's a cation. But you compare that to sodium cations. There's no comparison. You got to take it case by case. This is not something you can come up with simple rules. This is why chemical. This is why you look at that thing on Wikipedia and you, you say, "Are there any chemical properties?" No. You know, um, if there was, you know, it, it'd be simple. You just look it up like the physical properties. And so this is stuff that you have to learn. And how do you learn this? You have to. You learn this by seeing it. You know, there are mechanics, auto mechanics out there. Well, if you, you, you take your car, you, and you, let's say, um, unless you do the mechanics yourself, but if you take your car, you want to take it to somebody who has a lot of experience. They have a lot of experience. They've seen it before. I've seen this before. I've seen that before. You know, it's simple, right? But the same thing here, you know, um, you, you got, uh, I don't know how many years of data like this, and you go, okay, do you want to take 30 years to, to learn this, to learn how to do this? No, you don't. You don't want to take 30 years. What you want to do is you want to cram 30 years into as short a time as possible, and so this is what we're doing. We're cramming 30 years of experience into something short so that you can pick it up quickly and actually get some kind of skill that's going to be, um, it's not, of course, this is not an easy skill to develop, but it's, a, it's going to be a skill that not everybody has. You, know? you have to think about that because, um, you know, just because you have, a, let's say, a degree in something doesn't mean you have any skills in that, you know. Um, and so, uh, anyway, what we, what we need to do is we need to d d develop some specialized knowledge here. And um, it's actually not as difficult as, as some people think. You know, some people give up, um, 
you know, even before taking the first step. They give up before taking the first step because this is not in the book. They think it's not fair, but, you know, in science, it's, it's never fair. You know, it's just what it is. And, um, and so what we can do is we just pick up little bits here and there. It's not we're going to be um, experts in everything, but as we pick up little bits here and there, there's this many steps ahead of most people. And so anyway, how do we know this stuff? Well, we take it case by case. One way to know the, the cations is we look at some cations and see what the observations are. And so these cations are totally unreactive, right? Because these cations are the conjugates of these. These are super reactive, therefore these are super unreactive. And so as we go up, we look at these. And so we get more and more reactive cations. Now take a look, what's the most reactive cation that you see there? What is the most reactive cation that you see there? What is the most reactive cation that's on this list? Let me take a step back because it sounds like uh, there's something missing. Here. What are the two most reactive chemicals on this list? Fluorine and lithium. Fluorine and lithium. And so what we do is we just go down the list. Fluorine, very reactive. That means ozone is very reactive. And we just go down, we just read down the list until we get to the bottom of the list. When we get to the bottom of the list, we hit lithium ion. What can you say about lithium ion? It's the least reactive. It's totally unreactive, right? So then we go on the opposite end. Lithium is the most reactive. Then we go up and we get less and less reactive as we go until we hit the very top of the list. The very top of the list is fluoride. Fluoride is the least reactive. So fluoride is stable. Fluoride doesn't want to react in redox. Fluoride wants to react in metathesis but not redox. This is why I was talking about the bones earlier. So fluoride's highly unreactive. This is why I was asking about chloride earlier. I know chloride's totally unreactive you know, it's up here, as far as redox goes. All right, then the question was the anion, the cations. The cations, you look for the patterns. Okay, what are the patterns in the cations? Are all the cations more reactive than the anion? Well, looking at this, it looks like the anions are quite a bit more reactive. But that doesn't quite make sense because I was talking about why would anions be on this side of the list? You know. The anions are on this side of the list, if you're thinking about it, why? Because this side of the list is electron poor or electron rich. No, okay. What you the the first step in um you know a lot of people um what they'll do is they'll try to absorb it all at once. The the first step is you just make a little memorization. You know, don't worry about why, just memorize it. And so the first thing, two things to memorize are fluorine and lithium. Why? Don't, don't worry about why, just memorize it. Okay, then you look at the, you just read the entries. You read the entries. Okay, then later on we start asking ourselves, hey, this doesn't make any sense. You know? Cations should be more reactive than anions. Why should cations be more reactive than anions? Shouldn't they have they want more electrons more than anions? See, these are the types of things that you, you start thinking about. You start thinking about when you have the luxury of time to think about these things. You know, if you just look at this list once, like right before the test or during the test, then you don't really have the, the time to reflect on this type of stuff. But you'll start to notice these things the more times you look at it. This is like gaining that 30 years of experience. You gain that 30 years of experience really quickly by just keep going through the list. 
you know, people who've been doing this 30 years have seen this list so many times. They, you know, they pr pretty much have it memorized, and then they start thinking about, you know, why is that? Why is why does this behave this way and not that way? These types of things. Then you then you start to understand it in a lot more detail. So what we're trying to do is what I'm trying to do here is, you know, try to cram, you know, 30 years of experience or whatever. I mean, that's what the book does anyway. The book takes centuries of. The, stuff and condenses it and puts it into one semester. How can you do that? Well, is that fair? Well, that's how science, you know, grows. The science grows because, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. If you had to reinvent the wheel, it's going to take you a full 30 years to do it, right? But you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so we can do it quite rapidly. And so this is the same thing with this. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to condense all this information. This took, this took many people many, many years to compile this information. And so we're just going to use this. And the way we're going to use it is we're just going to read it, you know, just read the entries here. That's it. We're going to just try to get familiar and look for patterns. Well, one of the patterns is, you might have seen this, anions are more reactive than cations. Is that an accurate comparison? No, it's not an accurate comparison because we have to be careful. Does that mean that neutrals are more reactive than both cations and anions? If you look at a neutral, fluorine's neutral, ozone's neutral, so these are the most reactive, the two most reactive, that's more reactive than the anion. This anion's more reactive than the most reactive cation. I asked you what the most reactive cation was, it's silver ions, most reactive cation on this chart. On the left side, on the right side, do you know what the most reactive cation is? On the right side, tin two is the most reactive cation. But they're doing opposite thing. Here. They're doing opposite things. And so these are the types of things we'll pick up as we go along. But the first step is, is very simple. The first step is memorize those two and then read this once in a while. That's it. Don't worry about, OK, uh, it's good that you're worrying about the patterns. But when you look at this, can you come up with a pattern? Cations are more reactive. Anions are more reactive. No, it's more complicated than that, or a lot more complicated than that. But we, we started breaking it down. You know, why is the third most reactive species an anion? Here. You know, well, this one's different because this one has a what type of link on it? Peroxide link. This one, this one we figured out. You know, why is this one so reactive permanganate? Because it's manganese plus seven. Because it's manganese plus seven. Magnesium plus seven is highly reactive. Dichromate, this has chromium. Chromium six is very reactive. And so these are little things that we're starting to pick up as we go along. But um, anyway, this, this is a bit more complicated. So the first step is just to be able to use this chart. And don't worry about you know which one's more reactive, which one's less reactive. Just use the chart just to gain familiarity with it. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to start um, using this chart to try to understand. And so one of the things to understand is what's the difference between chlorine and chloride? You know, uh, a lot of people have a, a hard time understanding the difference between sodium ion and sodium metal until you see it, until you see it react. You know, when you see it react, then you can register that. And so, um, we saw sodium metal react with water very violently. It makes sodium ion, which is very stable. I didn't show you how fluorine reacted. I just told you verbally. What's did I say about fluorine? Fluorine is so reactive that it'll catch what on fire? Fluorine is so reactive it'll catch stainless steel on fire. Let me tell you a little bit more. I used to work with fluorine. I, I did a lot of work with fluorine. In fluorine, we stored it, the cylinder of fluorine, in a quarter inch steel case. That way, if there was any leak, it would have to eat through a quarter inch of steel first, and that would give you enough time to escape out of the lab. The 
I was taught, when I started flooring chemistry, I was taught the flooring chemist handshake. You know, it's a, the flooring chemist, do you want to see the flooring chemist handshake? Flooring chemist handshake goes like this. The first year you're at the flooring chemist convention, it's like this. Hey, how you doing? You know, the next year, it's like this. How's it going? Good to see you again. The next year, it's like this. Oh yeah, everything's going good, you know, with the flooring. And then this, this, and then you have to retire from flooring chemistry, basically. Um, because uh, you've lost all your fingers. And so um, that, that almost proved true because I had a leak in my flooring system. The way I, I, I found out I had a leak in my flooring system was I went to shut off the valve and I wore triple gloves. My gloves caught on fire, like, like this, when I went to shut off the valve. And, oh, I got a leak, a flooring leak, you know. That was it. Um, so, but you know, it's, yeah, it's uh, pretty nasty stuff. But you want it. You want to use this stuff because it's so powerful. An oxidizer. I was trying to make, you know what I was trying to make? What, what's the most common charges of iron? Plus three and plus two. I was trying to make iron plus four is what I was trying to make at that time. Somebody claimed to have made iron plus four. So I was just trying to repeat their, their synthesis. That was a lot of work, oh, and I think I got it uh, so close and ran out of time. But I, I, uh, I was using fluorine. What I do is, uh, fluorine's a gas, so what I do is I cool it down, liquefy it. Fluorine, uh, you can cool it down um, and liquefy without too cold of a temperature, so I could do it with liquid nitrogen. And so I, I cooled it down with liquid nitrogen and made fluorine liquid. Once I had fluorine liquid, then I wrapped it with heat, heat tape, and then cranked up the heat. And so I generated about 200 atmospheres of fluorine inside the little stainless steel reactor, which is very dangerous. And then I uh, cooked the stuff. Then when I went to go take it apart, you know, you can't expose this stuff to air because uh, it's so reactive. So when I went to take it apart, the, um, I had it, you know, all this, uh, I use Monel steel, which is very unreactive. It's like a stainless steel, um, but it's very good for um, flooring because it has a pretty high nickel content. I went to disassemble my apparatus and I couldn't break the nut loose. It was just welded on there. And so these are tools I had in this box. It's called a glove box and a hammer and I couldn't break it loose. This is at UCLA. And so I, after days of trying, I finally had to give up. And so I took it down to the machine shop and they have vice there. And so what I was gonna do on the vice was I was gonna put it on the vice and then just gently break it loose without letting air get in there because the air would kill it. And so I went to break it loose and it, it, it just snapped loose. Air got in there and killed it, but before air got in there, I took a look and the color was right. You know, it was the right color. And so I might have made it. But anyway, that was, uh, that was months and months of work. A very dangerous work. There. At UCLA, they have a lab. They have a lab on the roof that they use very reactive chemicals. It's an explosives lab. And uh, if they blow up the lab, it's on the roof, so they aren't going to affect any floors there. But, um, but the stuff I was doing was <laughs> could have uh, wiped out the entire floor with that. But fortunately, uh, well, anyway, I, I retired early, obviously, from flooring. I don't want to do flooring chemistry anymore. It's too dangerous. Uh, but uh, this stuff, this stuff is very nasty, very dangerous stuff. You know. Um, so this is how we're going to get some idea about reactivity. Well, silver ion is not super dangerous, but still it's moderate oxidizer. So we got to worry. This cation, where sodium ion is not dangerous at all. Sodium ion is very stable. And so cations, to group them all together, you can't. You have to look at them individually. There's no way you can group things together. The same thing with anions. Look at this. This anion, totally unreactive. Totally unreactive. This anion, wickedly reactive. 
permanganate, dangerous stuff. And so anions you can't group together. You gotta look at them individually. There's no way. And so how do you look at them individually? This is what we're doing. We're trying to go through these individually to look, you know, what types of things we look for in terms of chemical properties. You know, it'd be nice if there's a I don't know why the books don't do this. It'd be nice if the books did this so I wouldn't have to do so much work. Um, a lot of books just say, ah, uh, this is what they call descriptive chemistry. A lot of books just say, forget it, just Google it or, or something. But you Google these things, it doesn't always come out. There's still lots of explosions. There's an explosion in Hawaii where um, she, she lost her arm. Did you hear about that? The University of Hawaii, hydrogen explosion. Uh, the, the container blew up. She, they had to amputate her arm. That happened like last year or the year before. You know, simple stuff like that. You know, people don't don't think because uh, they can just. Cool. Well, the, I changed my thinking about this because I was thinking, um, you know, people have to have a better sense of um, chemical properties because I, I had. Did you know I had an explosion in the lab here? I had a student making up a lab, and. Um, in the makeup lab, they are using ethanol. Ethanol is a great, what we call, reducing agent or reducer. <coughs> ethanol is a good fuel. It's electron rich ethanol. If we look at the oxidation states of ethanol, go ahead and take a look. This is the condensed structural formula for ethanol. What are the oxidation states for ethanol? Well, first we do hydrogen, and hydrogen is what? Actually, you know, I'm going to make this a little easier because we'll do the rules that we do for uh, the rules that I, I put up. These are the rules that you'll find in the Chem Compact and the rules you'll find in Chapter 19. So which, which atom do we do first in ethanol? We do hydrogen first. Hydrogen goes at plus one. And then we do oxygen. Oxygen goes next at, that means carbon is what? Minus two. Okay, so this minus two plus six is plus four. That means um, we have to have minus four, so each one has to be minus two. Good, you're right, minus two. Now, minus two on carbon, is that electron rich or electron poor? Well, we call it because that electron rich. A minus two on oxygen, is that electron rich or electron poor? We consider that happy as is. Look at water. Is, is water very flammable like ethanol? No. Is the, oxygen is not electron rich. And so this is happy as is. Hydrogen with a plus one is happy as is. So what gives ethanol its flammability is carbon. Carbon here is electron rich. What's one of the most electron rich carbon species is methane. Methane is very electron rich. Well, what, what's hydrogen? Hydrogen is plus one. That's OK. Carbon is minus four. Minus four is the most electron rich carbon can get. Why? Because when it gains four electrons, it's like neon. And so minus four. So methane is the most. So methane's highly flammable. Ethanol is highly flammable too. It's still quite electron rich. At minus two. And in fact, when you get to Chem 1A, we do it in a lot more detail. In Chem 1A, we would look at the individual carbons because these two carbons are quite different. This carbon turns out to be a minus three, and this carbon turns out to be a minus one. The average is minus two. But in Chem 1A, we'd look at them individually because we want to know how each one behaves versus how they behave as a collective average. Sometimes we don't want the average, we want the individual. But that's Chem 1A. I don't want to get too advanced here. And so we're going to keep it simple. We'll just do the average, it's okay. Actually, there's a lot of stuff. A lot of people have been saying, I'm, doing Chem I'm not doing Chem 1A. In Chem 1A, we do a much more intense um, presentation of this. So I'm trying to keep it. Um, bit uh, toned down a notch here.
But still, um, this will make the transition to Chem1A a lot smoother because then it's easy to pick up the more advanced, uh, subtle things that you'll see. But, but here, the first thing, we, we just want to be able to use this chart. You know, we don't, you, know, you don't have to understand this chart to use it. You know? But the more you understand, the better off you are because the more you understand, if something does not occur on the chart, then you're capable of answering it. Somebody who just knows how to use this chart, this is their whole universe here. And so if there's something like perchlorate, perchlorate doesn't occur on the chart. Ethanol doesn't occur on the chart. If, you're, if you have something like ethanol or you have something like perchlorate, they're not on the chart. The people who, this is their entire universe, can't go beyond that. But if you know a little bit more, then you can go beyond it. You can say, okay, perchlorate's expected to be a, this. Ethanol's expected to be this. Uh, you can go well beyond it. And so um, that, that's more chem, chem 1A. Uh-huh. Uh, not very much. So um, Right now, uh, don't worry about you know which one's strong or which one's weaker. Just just memorize fluorine and lithium, and then you can look the rest out. Fluorine and lithium, look the rest out. And so that's what we're going to do um, here. go with the chemical properties. I mean, this is a chemistry class. What are the chemical properties of sodium chloride? Yeah. What are the chemical properties of sodium chloride? Some people would say this. Well, um, sodium chloride can react with uh, water to form chlorine, hydrogen, and sodium hydroxide. Does it really react with water? There's got to be something more to this. You know, if you put table salt in water, do you get chlorine, hydrogen, and sodium hydroxide? So this, this, this electrolysis is conducted in either a mercury cell, diaphragm cell, or a membrane cell. Electrolysis is a chemical process where you stick electrodes in there and turn up a voltage. And so here, they're electrolyzing sodium chloride in water. Actually, um, it's not hard to do this. This is pretty easy to do. And I try to bring in the electrolysis setup to show you this. Okay, that's one. Sodium chloride is used in the solvate process to produce sodium carbonate and calcium carbonate. But what is the solvate process? Let me click on that there and see. The solvate process. Okay, so here we go. Sodium chloride plus calcium carbonate yields sodium carbonate and calcium chloride. That's the solvate process. So what we can do is this. We can just do reaction by reaction and then just try to memorize it, but is that an effective way to learn chemical properties? Because if you think about it, how many different substances can I react sodium chloride with? A lot. You know, for, so for example, let me test the reactivity. So I'll mix sodium chloride with ethanol. Okay, nothing happened. I'll mix sodium chloride with methanol. Okay, nothing happened. I'll mix sodium chloride with propanol nothing happened. I'll mix sodium chloride with bleach. I'll mix sodium chloride with acid. I'll mix sodium chloride with this. Well, which acid are you mixing it with? I'll mix it with hydrochloric acid, and then hydrobromic acid, and then hydroiodic acid, and on and on and on. You know, is that the way you're going to learn chemical properties, is by taking sodium chloride and mixing it with an infinite, or potentially infinite number of chemicals? Seemingly infinite number? No. And so what we have to do is we have to break it down into simpler categories uh, of reaction. 
And so what, when I look at this Wikipedia, this Wikipedia is just going through, okay, let's pick some random reactions that sodium chloride does. Okay, here's a solvate process. Okay, here's another one, sodium chloride with CO2, NH3, and water. This forms sodium bicarbonate and ammonium chloride. Okay, so there's some calcium carbonate. Let's uh, let's take a look at. Uh, well, that's it. Was that pretty comprehensive? Not at all. Right. And so what we need to do is we need to come up with a better organizational scheme to understand chemical reaction. And so this is why I, I told you, rather than doing this, this is what the book does. The book does the same kind of thing. The book gives you a certain number of patterns to memorize, but is it comprehensive? No, it's just a selection of patterns that you might see it react in, but it's not comprehensive. And so what I'm giving you is a more comprehensive um, way of looking at it, although not completely comprehensive because I want to avoid some complicated reactions I'll talk about in a minute. And so rather than this, rather than looking at it reaction by reaction like this, we try to categorize into groups or types of reaction. How many different types of chemical reactions are there? Three. And so what we're looking at are what, uh, what are the three types of chemical reactions that sodium chloride can undergo? And so this is the way we break it down. Sodium chloride can undergo, well, what's the first type of reaction we, we looked at? Metathesis. So in metathesis, we're looking at what? We're looking for what we call favorable ion combinations. So all I look at are what ions does sodium like to pair up with? I mean, really pair up with, not being forced. Because a lot of people will say chloride, you know, because sodium chloride, it forms table salt, but the only way to get sodiums and chlorides to come together is to evaporate all the water. You know. As the room gets smaller and smaller, you know, the sodium and chloride stay apart from each other. This is what the way it looks like. Let me, uh, let me show you in terms of simulation. slow down. And so we have liquid water here. And the liquid waters are attracted to each other. What holds the liquid water together are electrical attraction. If you think, how heavy is a single water molecule? Is a single water molecule heavier than dust? Or lighter than dust? The, uh, the, I, I want to get rid of a, a misperception here. A lot of people think that you know water is heavy, and therefore gravity holds water down. Gravity will not hold water down because each water molecule is 18 U, which is nothing. And so, you know, if you were to blow on the surface of water like this on the surface of water, it should be like a dust cloud. You know, all of a sudden you should have a huge dust cloud of water molecules coming up because dust, a dust particle weighs way more than 18 U. And so if you blow on dust particle, it, it shoots up into the air. Why? Because nothing's really holding the dust particles to, to one another very tightly. But, but what holds the water molecules together are the, this is more up to speed here. This is, uh, you can see rotational. Do you see rotational? Do you see vibrational? Do you see translational motion? This is uh, real time, I think, here. But look at the sodium ions and the chloride ions. Are they coming together or are they staying apart? They're staying apart. They're going to stay apart until the water starts to disappear and then they're forced to come together to form a lattice like this. This lattice is showing just what type of motion. Now it's melting. 
Before it was just uh, vibrational motion, but as the temperature increased, then you got more and more kinetic energy, and this is molten sodium chloride, 800 degrees C. Well, anyway, uh, If there's no water around, then the sodium and the chlorides are going to come together and form a lattice like this. This lattice is pretty strong. So there's this, this table salt going in here. So the water has come along. And there's collisions here. This is really slowed down. This is super slow motion. But there's going to be more violent collisions here the kinetic energy that can knock these ions off. But the water molecules are attracted to these ions. They like these. Uh, and these are electromagnetic forces? Electrical forces. Electrical or the mag magnetic is not the key player here. Magnetic's not big. These are these are all molecular dy dynamics. These are all simulations based on theory here. And so the sodium chlorides stay apart until they're forced together. Um, and so, yes, sodium chloride does form, but what we're looking for is something that will immediately attack the sodium ions. And um, is there anything? And then we, we think in terms of the solubility rules. Sodium is, sodium salts are all soluble. And so this is pretty much unreactive. Now, there's no real anion that will attack that. What about chloride? Yeah, there are some anions that, well, actually chloride is an anion. There are some cations that will attack it. So when we put this in motion, what will happen is the cations and the anions will come together in solution and bond each other, and then more will bond, and pretty soon it'll get heavier and heavier, and then they'll sink due to gravity. Otherwise, it'll be suspended in solution here as a suspension. And so there are some cations that will that will actively seek out and react with this. What are they? Silver. Lead two and mercury one. Uh, how how do I know? I just memorized those. Silver, lead two, and mercury one. These will actively seek out chloride, precipitate out. And so, did I show you the precipitation simulation already, or its precipitations? Well, you saw it in the lab. If you, but for those of you who didn't, you'll see it again. Let's look at the AGCL.
highly concentrated solutions containing silver ions and chloride ions are mixed. The resulting solution is supersaturated with silver chloride. A precipitation reaction occurs until the system reaches equilibrium. In this model, the red and white molecules are water. Chloride and silver ions, gray and green respectively, are in solution. When they encounter each other, they bond and bind with other silver chloride molecules that have precipitated from solution to form the solid. All right, it's not really molecules, it would be unimpaired. And so they actively seek each other out and bond. And the same thing would happen with lead. Same thing with mercury, one. They would actively seek out and bond, whereas, whereas sodium ions wouldn't in solution like that until they're forced to. And so this is metathesis, but is metathesis the only way it can react? No, not. And so what we do is we go to the next one. What is the next one type of reaction that we look at? Acid base. Okay, I, I need to put a little asterisk here because um, I'm, I'm ignoring one type of acid base. I'm ignoring one type of acid base because it's, it's more complicated than what I want to get into. And so what we ha have here is, um, no, Lewis acid base reactions, these are in Chem 1B. I'm not going to talk about them in Chem 4 here. And so there's one big chunk of acid-base reactions that are um, not discussed here. And so you have to be aware of that, that you might miss. But you know, we, there's always a chance we might miss things because in chemical reactions, chemical reactions depend on many factors. Depends on the temperature, the concentrations, how you do things. So it, 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 it's easy. Can you tell me exactly how to burn this so I get the maximum amount of carbon monoxide? You know, which, how, how much should I turn? Should I turn a quarter turn, half turn? What should I do? I want the maximum, I want, you know, why do I want the maximum amount of carbon monoxide? I want to study, maybe I want to study the effects of carbon monoxide. So I want to burn this to get only carbon monoxide. Can I? Well, you tell me the exact conditions. I need to do that. Or I don't want any carbon monoxide at all. You know, I don't want to poison myself. I want zero carbon monoxide. Okay, you tell me how I'm going to burn this to get zero carbon monoxide. You see, so a lot of this is just too complicated because there are many variables that it depends on. And so a lot of people just do it. They just do it in the measure. How much carbon monoxide did you get? You know, you buy a little detector and you do it. That's a lot easier than trying to theoretically predict it. Just measure it, right? Make some adjustments, change the air, change this, and see how much you get. But, you know, of course there's always a chance that, you know, we might miss something or do something like that, but that, you know, it's a lot better to have some idea than just to be um, totally um, in the dark about what, what might potentially happen here. But anyway, we go to sodium. Sodium is not on the list. I've seen that list many times, you know, and I know that sodium is not on the list because um, I, I don't even need to see that it's on the list or off the list. Um, but do you see sodium ions on the acid base chart anywhere? No. Well, this is the Bronsted acid base chart, and Bronsted acid bases are proton donors and proton acceptors. When we get to something called the Lewis acid base chart, the Lewis acid base chart is a heck of a lot more complicated, and sodium can occur on the Lewis acid base chart, but we're skipping that for right now. It's okay to skip it because um, it turns out sodium is unreactive on both. And so not on the list for Bronsted. But chloride is on the list. And so um, chloride is on the list on the left side, we call these the acids. On the right side, we call these the bases. So chloride's a base. Chloride is a base. 
And so this is where a lot of people leave it. You know, chloride's a base. But we don't want to leave it there because we want to know, you know, how good of a base is chloride? Is it a strong base, weak base? What's the strongest base on the list? Did I ask you to memorize the strongest acid on this list and the strongest base? The strongest acid is perchlorate, perchloric acid. The strongest base on this, on, I know the strongest base on that list is what? be able to name it. The strongest base on that list up on the wall is NH2 minus, which is called, NH2 minus is called, starts with amide. Amide or amide, you know, um, people pronounce it in different ways. Amide would be, you know, the usual ide ending. Four things. This is ammonia with the ide ending, amide. The, the strongest base on this list, on the chart here, is actually not amide. Guess what the name of this is? CH3 minus. Well, we know this one. What was this one right here? Amide. Amide. What's this one? Sulfide, oxide, hydride. <laughs> Look at the pattern. Sulfide, amide, oxide, hydride. Carbide is close, but carbide is C4 minus. Carbide's already taken. Carbide is carbon with a 4 minus charge. So silicon carbide would be silicon with a 4 plus and carbon with a 4 minus. So carbide's already taken. So we have to come up with a different one. Come up with a different one. Can you see the pattern? These are the types of patterns that people see after looking at this multiple times. You know, sulfide. And naming these. You remember when we went through that exercise of naming each of the species? Yeah. You know, well, one, for nomenclature. And two, maybe we can start seeing certain patterns, this kind of stuff. So sulfide, amide, oxide, hydride. Look at, what did we call this one? Amide, why? Ammonia, amide. What's this one called? Methane, methide. And so CH3 minus is called methide. Do you see the pattern? If you see the pattern, then you're already many steps ahead of most people, you know? Because most people, they don't, they don't bother looking at this much. You know? So something like that. Is You know, a lot of people say, oh, something like that is not, not, well, anyway. So, uh, methide's the strongest base on this list here. So, if methide's the strongest, that means chloride must be one of the weakest. In fact, chloride is so weak, and this is what you got to put down. Do we even consider chloride uh, a base? We don't. In fact, all these are so weak that we don't consider them bases. They're too weak to be is a base, but it is too weak. To really um, be considered. And so what bases can do is they can neutralize acid. So let's say you spilled some battery acid on the floor. Oh, I spilled some battery acid on the floor. Could you use t sprinkle table salt on the battery acid to neutralize it? It's not going to work. Why? Because chloride is too weak. It's not going to react. That's why. 
And so little things like this we use as reference points. It's like, you know, it's like if you move to a, if you move to a new city or something, you want some reference points so that you can get your bearings and orientation. We do the same thing. When we do move to a new chart like this, we need some reference points so that we can get some bearings and orientation. And so the reference points would be like perchloric, powerful acid. Methide, powerful base. And that gives us a little bit of orientation. How powerful? Fluorine, powerful oxidizer. How powerful? You want to know. Fluoride, not. And so we, we register those little reference points so that when we use the chart, we can place things appropriately. And so here, chloride is a base, but it's too weak. To, and so sodium chloride acid base properties uh, are, are not significant. In fact, they're so insignificant, we consider sodium chloride neutral as far as acid-base properties go. It's unreactive. <coughs> Okay, then we move on to um, what else do we have? Redox. So we move on to redox, uh, which will be three here. And then we look at sodium ion. So first we go down and uh, take a look at, uh, at sodium ions. And we, we find sodium ions on the left hand side of this chart. And so we use fluorine as a reference point. So we go from fluorine, which is the most powerful oxidizer. These are oxidizers, they take electrons here. And when we go down, is sodium a powerful oxidizer? No. no. In fact, sodium, we would call it an extremely weak oxidizer. You know, sodium ion is extremely weak. In fact, we don't really worry about, oh, you know, when you sprinkle table salt on your french fries, should you pop a whole bunch of antioxidants afterwards to worry about the sodium ions oxidizing any of your tissue? No. Because sodium ions, um, these are, yeah, these are oxidizers, but these are, but it is too weak. too weak to really be considered an oxidizer. Okay, when I say that, it's all relative. It depends, it's relative to what you react it with, right? And so, of course, sodium ions are, are weak, but they're not the weakest. There are even weaker ones, right, than sodium ions. And so, yeah, sodium ions are going to be, you know, not really considered unless you do this. And so this is the next level we're going to look at this table. And the same thing goes with the acid bases. It's like this. Sodium ions are so weak, will they oxidize sodium metal? No, if you took sodium ion, and put it against sodium metal, you have two, a tug of war. Sodium, sodium, one electron, who's gonna win? It would be a tie, you know, because the sodium versus sodium, it would be a tie, right? Now, that's with sodium, but um, if you had something that lost its electrons even easier, like calcium, Calcium loses its electrons easier than sodium. So if you pair up sodium ion again versus calcium, sodium ion will win. Versus, versus if you look at magnesium, magnesium holds onto its electrons more tightly. Magnesium holds onto electrons more tightly. If you put sodium ion versus magnesium, sodium ion loses. And sodium, so sodium ion actually will react with calcium metal. So don't mix sodium chloride with calcium metal. You're gonna get a reaction. Don't mix sodium chloride with potassium metal. You're gonna get a reaction. And don't mix sodium metal with lithium. I mean, sodium ion with lithium, you'll get a reaction. And so this is it. 
Here it's a tie. So anything stronger than sodium, it will react with. Anything weaker than sodium, it won't react with. That's how we figure this out. And so we, we can say a lot more than just this. You know, this is a very broad statement, but we can get very specific. You know, what will it react with? And we can say what it will react with once we know the chart. And so the only species that this will react with are calcium, potassium, and lithium. Well, those aren't that common, so we'll just ignore them. Chloride. Look at chloride. We see it here. And one thing we notice about chloride is it's a on this side of the chart it's a reducer because if we go backwards here it's losing electrons. This is the only thing chloride can do. So um, we call it a reducer. Now the strongest reducer is lithium, and so chloride would be considered a yeah. In fact, it's a very weak reducer. How, how do I know? Um, just in terms of reactivity, you know, sodium chloride is not that reactive, but it, it could be a reducer. Um, however, like, there's certain things, like chloride's a weak reducer. So will chlorine oxidize chloride? So chlorine versus chlorine, it's a tie, right? And so you need something stronger than chlorine to oxidize chloride. What is stronger than chlorine? that can oxidize chloride. Well, what's stronger than chlorine would be dichromate. Is that stronger than chlorine? No, dichromate's weaker. If dichromate's weaker, then there's no way it's going to happen. So dichromate, manganese 4, oxygen, iodate, bromine, nitrate, these are all weaker. We need something stronger, which would be Lead 4 oxide. Lead 4 oxide will react with chloride. It'll take the electron away, form chlorine to permanganate. And so one of the ways we make chlorine gas in lab is uh, we take potassium permanganate and mix it with HCl. When we take potassium permanganate, mix it with HCl, the potassium permanganate will strip the electron off chlorine, chloride and form chlorine gas. So we can generate fresh chlorine gas easily. In fact, we're going to do that. We're going to do that on Thursday. You're going to take some um, HCl and then add some potassium permanganate and generate some fresh chlorine gas. But we, we don't have to use potassium permanganate. We could also use hydrogen peroxide, ozone, fluorine. Do you want to use fluorine? No, I don't want to use fluorine, but potassium permanganate is okay. So. It's a, it's a weak reducer, and it doesn't react with much, but it will react with you know, some more. Potassium permanganate is a common salt. And so a very weak reducer will react with powerful permanganate, et cetera. Won't react with a bunch of these other ones. All right, so um, we'll stop here. I went too long for this one, and then we'll get some practice with this in a minute.